Watch this. An affordable housing crisis thrown on top of a pandemic. A combination that led to a federal moratorium on evictions that will end at the end of this month. Idaho's most populous county is testing a new way to solve potential evictions. Looking for a way to gain an edge in this competitive housing market? Have you looked at writing a letter to the buyer? Well, if you're looking at moving west across the border into Oregon, don't expect it to work. This world-class fishing hotspot near Bellevue attracts anglers from all around the world, but fishermen have been told to cool it this year because of the heat. It's the day we've had marked on our calendars since, well, last week. Could we break the consecutive day streak of highs 100 degrees or hotter? Today's that day. City of Boise, City of Boise, triple digits. You did it! City of Boise, 10 days in a row now, triple digits. Congratulations! Yeah, we had this, this big celebration planned. We were going to celebrate the fact that we got triple digit temperatures for the 10th day in a row. This is dumb. Not this. This isn't dumb. What is dumb is the heat and the stretch of 100 degree days that we've been well surviving. I'm sure there's some snakes out there who have been enjoying it. But again, we were supposed to get there. and It's only 99. Well, at least we tied a record, right? I mean, the summer of 2021 is the first time that we've well, not. I was going to say that, but it's not. No, this would be the fourth time. Yeah, we've hit nine days in a row before. Three times, in fact. In 2003, 2006, and in 2015, we had nine straight days of 100 degrees or hotter. And we also did it yesterday. But this June, July, we'll be alone, maybe, if we get there, alone atop the table, as they say. The longest stretch of 100 degree days in the history of Boise. We can still make it. The streak began back on June 28th. Although it almost began the day before when we topped out at 99 degrees like we are today. But since June 28th, we've been roasting under this heat dome like a beef brisket at a barbecue competition. And along the way, we've tied daily records, including the back to back 105 104 on June 29th and 30th. Yesterday, we hit 107 officially at the Boise Airport, the home of Boise's National Weather Service office. And maybe you're new to the area or maybe you've been here a while and you're thinking, well, what's the big deal? It's always hot in Boise during the summer, but it, it's been like this for a lot. Or we've seen a lot more of these days or string of days like this for the past two decades. But how exactly hot has it been? Well, when you consider our average high temperatures during this time of the year in the upper 80s, lower 90s, our average high so far for the month of July, nearly 103 degrees. And this July could give the hottest ever July a run for its money. June already the second hottest since 1865, behind 1869 with an average of 76 degrees. And that's when you average all the highs and lows together. That's that average temperature. The warmest July on record was 2007 with an 83. And so far, we've managed a balmy 87.7 degrees this summer, mostly because our overnight lows have been warm as, as well, only dropping into the 70s. And last night, we bottomed out at 80, the warmest low since 1892. And we're not done yet. Right, Rick? Could we still get that triple digit temperature today? And will we see more coming up? I appreciate you saying that, Brian. You take the heat for this, okay? First of all, the high so far has been 99. It's been there for the last hour. It's just hanging there. We've got some northwesterly winds that might be doing that, but we also have the sunshine that could drive it up. Now, there's the record for the day of 108. Something else that Brian uh, didn't mention, but the record for 2003, that's all time record, was one summer with 20 days of 100 degrees or better. 20 days. We've had 10 so far, okay? We could possibly hit it by the middle of July on that one. Now for this evening, or this is for tomorrow, temperatures are starting to take a little bit of break from the 105s. We're gonna be seeing like a 97 to 100 for the next couple of days. These are the highs for tomorrow. And as you take a look at the next seven days, you can see the 100, but it, after Friday, it comes back up again. We're right around 100, to 100 degrees. So, Brian, we're going to do a, a tele-temperature for you, okay? Uh, we'll keep up with this. It's got to hit 100 sometime this half hour. We'll let you know. We hope to. Well, you know, these weather data tends, or the weather data, I should say, tends to be rather Boise-centric. After all, this is where the population is concentrated, in the capital city, and it's where National Weather Service Office is located. But it's been hot everywhere across southern Idaho of late, as indicated by this message we got from Wendy. The 208 
You keep talking about 10 days of triple digit temperatures. I'm fairly certain Payette County has surpassed that days ago. And while it's true that part of the state trends to be hotter in the summer than the upper Treasure Valley, and they have already run the 10 day row, 10 days in a row gauntlet, it hasn't been days. If we look at Ontario, Oregon data, which would be the closest weather station to Payette County, the city slogan is where Oregon begins, and they certainly began their hot streak before Boise. On June 24th, Ontario was 101. Then there were two days of 99, but the 100 degree decennial officially started on June 27th, a day before Boise's and reached 107 degrees three times in that stretch, including yesterday. And it was capped off today. Well, I don't know what's the temperature in Ontario today. We'll get to that in a second. You would have that would have made 101. So it did it 11 days in a row in Ontario of triple digit temperatures for the Idaho Oregon border area. And like we said, it is hot everywhere in southern Idaho right now. And while we've already talked about how the heat and the drought has put an end to growing seasons in South Central Idaho's Lincoln County, after just 28 days of irrigation water, the heat is taking its toll on other industries in that area. Here's the latest look at how badly drought is hitting Idaho this summer. Nearly 100% of the state is in the moderate drought category. And the worst part is right there in that Blaine Custer County area. You see that area indicated in red and that dark maroon. Given the forecast, likely won't be getting any better anytime soon. So other than farmers, fishermen have had to deal with the impacts. Silver Creek Preserve is one of Idaho's iconic trout fishing destinations. World class, world renowned, prized. I mean, pick your modifier. But late last week, the Nature Conservancy closed Silver Creek Preserve to fishing because of low water levels and high temperatures. And just like many of us, freshwater trout don't love this heat. Our tolerance is much higher than theirs, though. Here's Katya Stepovic. Can I help you? People from all over the world, it's a destination fly fishing, spring fed creek. Reneal Robinson has been volunteering at the Silver Creek Preserve every summer for the past 10 years. And if you want to go out this way, maybe you'd see a moose over in there. But the typical busy summer season that brings in thousands. It's just different being out here and seeing it so quiet. Visitors are few and far between. Are you aware that the stream is closed to fishing? About three or four years ago, we had some restrictions but we've never had this happen where we've had to actually shut the stream down. But the Nature Conservancy made the decision to restrict fishing July 1st for a number of reasons, something that's never been done before. The fish were low energy, they're lethargic, slow to recover in some places. Um, yeah, so that's when you see signs of that kind of stress combined with the water conditions that you know you need to do something. Low oxygen levels and high water temperatures can bring stress to these fish, making them have low energy and making it even hard for them to breathe. At one point, this water was at 78 degrees. Right now, you can see there's no water in the creek because the floats are so low. Erica Phillips, watershed manager with the Nature Conservancy, says the brown trout and rainbow trout in Silver Creek are cold water fish that get stressed out in any water temperatures above 70 degrees. Well, recent data says the stream temperature is at 73 degrees. So when the water temperature is 79 or 80 degrees, Phillips says fish start to die off. We know that they're already naturally stressed by the water conditions. And so we're actually just removing that additional stress that humans would cause either by catching them or wading in the creek. Um, honestly, it's disturbing. Um, you know, we're in this, this drought situation. Um, it's not the first drought we've seen. We're pretty sure it's not gonna be the last drought. We are in the situation we're in. Like there's not much we can do to improve conditions. While the fish rest up, the Nature Conservancy is focusing their efforts on water projects, like working with agriculture producers to use less water. They're also trying to find people to give away or sell their water rights so they can keep recharging the creek. Education also plays a big role. It's not just agricultural water consumption that's an issue. It's everybody using water, you know, to, to water major subdivisions and keep the grass green all season long. It's the, you know, like landscaping and um, the golf courses and even people using a lot of water in their lawns in the valley. I mean, all of that is cumulative, right? It's all water use and it's water that is, is not going into the aquifer for recharge to recharge places like this creek. Philip stays hopeful that current and future generations will make a difference because if not, 
if we start to have these warmer temperatures, then other species that are not necessarily what people would like to catch are gonna be the ones that start thriving in here. And it also raises the risk of things like disease and you know invasives and that kind of stuff when, when the actual stream conditions are evolving. Maybe this is one of those like, um, like a, maybe a blessing in disguise, you know, of telling people like this is real and it's happening here and you can see it in your backyard. And for Reniel. Okay, thanks for coming. She hopes to be able to continue to call this backyard her summertime home for 10 more years to come. It's beautiful, it's quiet. It's like our own little private preserve right now. <laughs> so, and I'm afraid for what's happening. And, um, you know, if this kind of weather continues, it's going to be very hard on Silver Creek. Well, Fish and Game controls the rights to Silver Creek, but the Nature Conservancy, that, that handles it. It's a private property, so they have the right to restrict access. And they have signs and volunteers letting people know that fishing in the creek is restricted. And they won't be, there won't be a fine. They will just kind of be letting people know and asking you to leave if you're fishing. Wow, 78 degree water temperatures, that's amazing. But Silver Creek, the preserve, isn't the only part of Silver Creek. What would Fish and Game consider when it comes to the rest of the areas? Yeah, well, there are parts of Silver, Silver Creek that are outside the preserve, and those are still open for fishing, of course. And I did speak to Fish and Game to see if they're considering implementing any similar restrictions, and they said no, and simply because they say fishing truly is not very good right now when it gets this hot. Catch rates tend to be pretty low, and then there's mortality. It, if it won't affect the overall population, they won't implement such restrictions. So unless the situation is essentially catastrophic, they won't be limiting fishing. Fishing, Brian. Yeah, fishermen know not to go there now because it's probably not a good day to catch fish. All right, Katya, that state, part of the state, getting been hit pretty hard with what we've been seeing this year. All right, sticking with the hot theme because it's hot and chances are you're probably sticky. Well, you may have seen this downtown the last several days, or maybe you saw it on Twitter. Don Kostelik posted this picture Tuesday evening after spotting this hose wrapped around a stoplight pole. He said, it's so cool to see ACHD installing water misters on downtown traffic signal poles to help Boiseans deal with these triple digit high temperatures. Then he put the red faced sweating emoji in there. Then he added another post, which included the hashtag my kind of highway district. Only it wasn't the Ada County Highway District that decided to cool off those waiting for the walk signal. This pole is located on the corner of 9th and Jefferson in downtown, which happens to be the same corner of McHugh Sports. And McHugh Sports is where that hose, well, the hose that fills that mister, happens to be hooked up. You see right there? And I asked them about it, and they said they usually have misters attached to the awnings outside their store windows for the comfort of their customers and anyone passing by on Jefferson. But those awnings, well, they aren't too big, and those years past have They've left water spots on their windows. So this year, they told me, since the awnings need an upgrade anyway and they're about to be replaced, they decided to attach the water feature to the traffic light. They were just being friendly and thought people would appreciate it. And as you can see there, yeah, they have. And they've taken advantage of it as well while waiting for the walk signal. So there you go. No, it wasn't ACHD nor any other kind of highway district. It was McHugh's who found a temporary use for their sidewalk heat suppressors. The Mr. Mystery now demystified. A pilot program is aiming to resolve eviction claims outside the courtroom. Instead, Idaho's most populous county hoping they can take care of most of them online. Online or by text is how we hope to hear from you. It's easy. All you have to do is text your thoughts and questions about what we talk about to 208-321-5614. Don't forget the hashtag, the 208, and make sure to include your name, maybe where you're from. That way, we know whose text we're reading at the end of the show.
All right, what if I told you that instead of going to court, you could deal with legal issues and negotiations online? And I don't mean by taking it to social media. In Ada County, when it comes to certain eviction claims, you can. Starting today, parties and new cases involving evictions for non-payment of rent will be invited to negotiate an agreement through a new online portal. Doing so could eliminate the need for people to go to court for those eviction specific issues. It's a pilot program that is right now just in Ada County. So we thought the idea sounded pretty unique. So Joe Paris went down to the Ada County Courthouse to learn about the ins and outs of the system and if court administrators believe it will actually work. We've been working hard to make sure that we can let people still have access to the courts. It's been a struggle at some times, but we've got some great support and a number of resources that have been helpful. Ada County Courts now have a new and unique resource for people to resolve certain eviction claims and disputes. An online portal designed to help mediate cases without having to physically go to court. It doesn't uh, take the place of the regular process. It runs at the same time while they're waiting for the court date and gives them an opportunity to mediate uh, amongst themselves to negotiate the case. So hopefully they can find a resolution that's agreeable to them before they come to court. Ada County Magistrate Judge Adam Kimball explains that this new pilot program is being tested in just Ada County to see if it's a viable solution. Kimball explains what type of eviction case qualifies. This only uh, addresses cases that are based on non-payment of rent. It does allow the parties to go outside of the very specific legal issues that are raised and so they may find things that uh, help them reach a resolution other than just the non-payment of rent. Once a qualifying case is filed, a link is sent to both the plaintiff and the defendant, aka the landlord and the tenant, inviting them to engage in a digital discussion. Is it as simple as this is just a mediation process you can do on your own? It is. So it's a negotiation process, kind of like sending a message back and forth. And then the system prompts some of the things that may want to be addressed in mediation. So you don't need experience or expertise in the eviction process. You don't need that experience or expertise in negotiation. It's going to prompt you through that, but it is uh, largely an, an, a uh, discussion process. So why is the pilot program being launched now? Well, the federal moratorium on evictions for non-payment of rent is expected to soon expire. We have the end of the eviction moratorium coming up at the end of the month. Uh, that could be extended, but it's unlikely. And so with the end of the eviction moratorium, there could be a an increase in the number of cases filed. We want to allow people and a way to resolve their cases uh, whenever it's convenient to them in an agreeable fashion. The program also helps people locate local resources that may help resolve disputes, including how to contact agencies that offer financial support for tenants whose ability to pay rent was affected by the pandemic. The system connects you with resources. Some of those resources could help you uh, if you were in a hole. Uh, but nothing that happens in the online eviction resolution is going to be used against you in trial if you go to trial. And so it's unlikely that you could dig a deeper hole going through this. It's really just a way to see if the case can be resolved before you come to court. If parties are able to come to an agreement through this process, a binding agreement is reviewed and ultimately approved by a judge. If sides cannot agree on something, then it's likely that the situation will head down a traditional legal process. What does success look like to you with this program? Well, success is uh, providing access to the public, uh, both the landlords and the tenants. Uh, people can come here without having to drive to court. They may not have to take time off work. They may not have to find child care. So success is people finding a resolution that works for both sides. If they don't, we still have the option for them to come and go through the traditional process. And I assume it would save some costs on maybe hiring a lawyer a little earlier in the process than maybe you have to. I mean, do you need a lawyer to go through this? No, and like the, the regular legal system, you don't need a lawyer to do this. Um, you may be recommended to have a lawyer to go through this process, Brian, but it is something you can do on your own. If you're uncomfortable doing something like that on your own, for sure, get a lawyer, get some legal advice. If you do go down that route, uh, your lawyer, your legal team will get that same link that you get in your inbox. So you won't have to you know, drive the car, so to speak. Your legal team could handle everything on the online portal, but um, it's just another option that Ada County's created to try and take on some of these eviction cases. There is some worry that there could be a lot of them at the end of the month when that federal uh, moratorium on evictions does expire or is expected to expire. And I guess if, if you can afford a lawyer, maybe you can afford to maybe pay a little bit of the rent. So I guess it's a yeah. All right. Thanks, Joe. The housing market, about the only thing hotter than the record-setting forecast. To gain an edge, some suggest you write a letter to the seller. It worked in the 208, but now 
Those letters are illegal in the 541. Well, here's something you can do, even if you are in Oregon. You can text the show, the number 208-321-5614. Include your name and don't forget the hashtag the 208. We're going to read a few of them and respond to them at the end of the show. Well, with this competitive housing market, potential home buyers always looking for any way to gain an edge. Some do this simply by offering a straight cash offer to avoid having to go through the loan process. Other way is to offer not just cash, but more of it, like a lot more money. But not everybody can do that. You've probably heard of or maybe even received one if you've sold a home, a so-called buyer love letter. It's an actual letter some in the industry suggest the potential buyers send to the sellers. And it usually includes a pulling of the heartstrings profession of love for the home. It could go into how the buyers see their life playing out in this home, family gatherings in the kitchen, the kids playing in the backyard with the dog. Some even include one small detail, that they are from Idaho. And experts say it kind of works. Sometimes the seller will take less money and in return, they get the reassurance that their home will be in good hands. Well, those letters, no longer allowed in Oregon. They were banned by House Bill 2550, a bill Governor Kate Brown signed last month. The bill directs selling agents reject any offer which includes direct communication from buyer to seller outside of the scope of a traditional offer. The problem with the letters? Well, according to the bill and our sister station KGW in Portland, they're discriminatory because those letters could reveal personal information about the buyer that they could then lead to potential discrimination. Sellers aren't allowed to discriminate against uh, anyone based on protected status, such as race, gender, religion, or family makeup. And those letters, well, they could open the door for some of that discrimination for any of those if they choose. Oregon is the first state to ban those letters. It comes one year after the National Association of Realtors discouraged agents from accepting them. So our question remains, considering the seller's market in Idaho has been, is, and likely will be for a while, like it is, would Idaho consider outlawing such letters too?
couple of messages today about the mediation pilot program for Ada County when it comes to evictions. And they got this question. What about landlord relief? We hear about the renters, but never the landlords. There are programs for them as well. You should look into that if that is a concern. When I was cutting bills, the Internet was the first to go. I know the library is open, but not everyone can get there. That's a good point, Karen, if you're cutting back and can't afford to pay rent. Never know if I'm doing this correctly. The 208, we need a name and maybe a question, comment.